I hope I don't disappoint you. <laughs> I listened to Geoffrey Roberts about the Catholic Church, and the one thing I thought about was a case in Florida that took place on 16 August 2009. And it's about a Muslim woman. Her name was Fatima Abdullah. The Florida police filed her case as a suicide. According to their investigation, she had knocked her head about six or seven times on a coffee table. She had four broken ribs. Her blood was sputtered, not only in the space where she knocked herself out, but all the way downstairs. The case is closed as a suicide. And listening to Mr. Robertson, I thought I would appeal to him to help us reopen that case. And if he does not, and if he cannot, then to show us, tell us, other lawyers who may. The fact that this case is dismissed and closed as a suicide is not only a shame on, I think, all civilized people and all atheist Americans, but particularly atheist people of Florida. I don't know if there are any atheists in Florida. <laughs> but we know about it, and I think we should have it reopened. Fellow unbelievers, or shall I say, you godless lot, <laughs> good afternoon. It's wonderful to be among friends. And I would like to take advantage of this moment to express my own personal grief and sadness at the death of Christopher Hitchens, who was a dear friend and a man who lived for the mind. I miss him, and I know you'll miss him fondly. Then I'll get to the intense question of this afternoon about the protests in the Arab world of 2011. The first question to be asked is, what would a secular spring mean to the societies in North Africa, as opposed to an Islamist winter? For me, secularism means democracy and the rule of law, and thereby the relevant institutions. An end to corruption. and an end to human rights violations. Freedom of speech so that government opposition can organize and compete for power with an incumbent office and freedom of the press. Freedom of conscience so that individuals can worship whatever they want and whoever they want, but they can also choose not to worship women's rights to veil or to unveil, to choose their own mates, to work outside the home, and keep their pay. And for me, a secular spring in the Arab world would mean the introduction of laws that would protect women from violence, not only in public, but particularly from violence at home. A 
a secular spring for the Arab world would mean economic growth that would attract foreign investment and where tourism would thrive. It would also mean peace with Israel, at least an acknowledgement that the Jewish people have a right to their own state. A secular spring in the Arab world would have ushered in the end of Islamic terrorism. That would be a thing of the past. The Muslim youth, particularly the male among them, would develop a confidence in life before death as opposed to life after death. But for those of you who have been watching what's going on in North Africa and the Middle East, what you see is not a secular spring for the Arab people and for the Muslims who live in that part of the world, but an Islamist winter. Everywhere where elections have been held, in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Morocco, we've seen Islamist victories in places like Yemen and Libya, where the old autocratic regimes have been toppled, we see informally that Islamists are in power or will soon be in power. In Saudi Arabia, the protests were silenced, not only through repression, which we never read about, but also through bribery. In Bahrain, a very small, oil-rich country, we did see the protests, and they were silenced through repression, but the response to that repression compared to the response to the repression committed by the likes of Mubarak was very mild in the West. In Syria, I think the most resilient of the Arab protesters it's ongoing, and the butcher in charge continues to massacre his own people. Ironically, however, it is very well possible that if Bashar al-Assad of Syria is toppled and the royal family of Bahrain are taken off power, that the Islamists will again win through fair elections. So what does an Islamist winter look like? What will it look like? There's a great deal of controversy over that among observers. A lot of them think that the Islamists once in power will become like the Christian Democrats of Europe. I don't think so. I think that the corruption that the Arabs protested against will be replaced by a religiously sanctioned one. We can see that because the Muslim Brotherhood, for instance, in Egypt and other places has infiltrated the opposition. They promised not to fill a candidate for presidency, but they did. They promised, more importantly, that they would be tolerant toward non-Muslims and women. And at this point, they are not. In the only country where they actually are part of the government, they have started putting away authors and artists on ludicrous charges such as provoking society. What on earth is an author supposed to do, or an artist, if not to provoke society? It also means that human rights will be violated, but this time it's going to be backed by Allah and his messenger. Forget about freedom of speech, that's going to be conditional to Islamic teachings. Forget about the freedom of the press, 
It will be allowed as long as, it's in con as long as it is convenient to push the autocrats out of office and as long as it is necessary to placate the West. Forget about the freedom of conscience, under is because under an Islamist winter, the plight of Christians in Egypt, for instance, but in also other places, is going to be dire and is dire. They are killed, their churches are destroyed, the women are raped, but it's not only Christians. It's also the plight of Muslim dissidents and that of Muslim minority sects. Women. Geoffrey Robertson earlier talked about, at length, what the Catholic Church does to young children. At least the Catholic Church is subject to the rule of law. When the Islamists take over, they're going to lower the age of marriage to nine. The concept of guardianship, a fact that females will never be considered to be capable adults, is going to become official. Women who work within the strictures of the Islamist agenda will be touted as strong, powerful women. And Sharia law will be applied to justify violence in public and accommodate more plainly violence at home for those women who find living under Sharia unbearable. As far as economic growth is concerned, Islamists obviously understand, in the short term at least, that to consolidate their power, they have to improve the economy. And to do that, they'll have to employ rational methods. Those rational methods will be implemented on the short term. Look at Turkey. But they will be justified with a range of fatwas, allowing, for instance, interest law. Peace with Israel. The double speak will continue. If you read anything that the leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamists say, what you will find in there is a call for the destruction of Israel. In English, they murmur something about standing by the rights of Palestinians to support a peaceful protest. But if you scan their language, if you scan their writings and their speeches, you will never find the promise of a two-state solution. Islamic terrorism under an Islamist winter is going to become a matter of domestic and foreign policy. Is the winter now settling over the Arab world as bleak as I have just described it? Or are there signs of hope? I see four signs of hope. The first is the election results in all of these countries where elections have been held. The secular parties did not do as well as the Islamists. But they are there, and they are significant. And some of them, in the case of Tunisia, are in fact part of the government. And these secular Arabs may not be atheists, but they are rational enough to conclude that the affairs of politics should be separated from the affairs of religion. A second sign of hope that I see is the Iran uprising of 2009. I don't know if you remember that, but those young men and women on the streets were not protesting against kleptocrats with a secular stamp on them. They were protesting against theocrats. They may not have 
voted or protested for a secular liberal democracy as we experience it here in Australia and in other Western countries, but they said no to Sharia after having lived under it for 30 years. The third sign of hope that I see is the Muslim diaspora. Ex-Muslims like me in Europe and in North America are growing in number. We give speeches, we publish articles and books, and we communicate with one another. We make use of such tools as Facebook and Twitter. And at this point, our impact may seem insignificant. But it has the potential of the free thinkers of Europe 200 years ago, or maybe 300 years ago. And I come to my fourth point. Talking of free thinking and Twitter, our project may not take centuries. For consider Hamza Kashgari. Put up your hand if you have heard of the name Hamza Kashgari. It's a pity because that makes me, that puts me in a position that I have to tell you who he is. It's a Saudi man, 23 years old, journalist, who on February the 4th this year, tweeted on the birthday of Prophet Muhammad about an imagined meeting with the Prophet. He had three tweets. Knowing how short they are, would you like me to read them to you? The first tweet, he says, on your birthday, I shall not bow to you, I shall not kiss your hand. Rather, I shall shake it as equals do and smile at you as you smile at me. I shall speak to you as a friend no more. Do you want to hear the second tweet? On your birthday, I find you wherever I turn. I will say that I have loved aspects of you, hated others, and could not understand many more. Third tweet. On your birthday, I will say that I have loved the rebel in you, that I've always been a source of inspiration, that you have always been a source of inspiration to me, and that I do not like the halos of divinity around you. I shall not pray for you. Hamza then clarified his tweets to those who preemptively misunderstood him. He said, I view my actions as part of a process toward freedom. I was demanding my right to practice the most basic human rights, freedom of expression and thought, so nothing was done in vain. I believe I'm just a scapegoat for a larger conflict. There are a lot of people like me in Saudi Arabia who are fighting for their rights. Hamza described the status of women's rights in Saudi Arabia by stating that Saudi women will not go to hell because it was impossible to go there twice. Now, it is developments like this one, individuals like Hamza, who give me the hope that I have that that world will change. When I was 23 years old, I was not advanced in my thinking as much as Hamza Kashgari is. And you may hold against me for those of you who know the story and say, yes, but the king of Saudi Arabia had him brought back to the country. The Mufti, Mufti is like a supreme leader among the clerics, demands that he be tried. And after he tweeted, 30,000 instant tweets and Facebook page uh, were started calling for his death. That is all true. But once you start thinking, and mark his words that he said he's not the only one, once you start having doubts like those, once you start having questions like those, then you don't go back, even if you're forced to apologize. 
And ultimately, even if you're killed, it is out there. Islamists come to power with the help and trust of like-minded people, with money and state power. For the secular spring that many of us hope for in the Arab world to take place, those secular parties, groups, and individuals need to win hearts and minds. And for them to do that, they need help. And I've asked myself over and over again, why is it that liberals, secular liberals in the West, fail to help not only secular Arabs, but all freedom-seeking peoples in the world to win the hearts and minds of populations? Why are liberals insecure about the morals they live by and in which they raise their children? I've asked around, and I found three explanations. I'm not sure they're the only explanations. I'm not even sure they are corrupt. Oh, sorry, they are correct. One of them is given by Roger Sandel, the Australian anthropologist. He says that it's because of romantic primitivism. People, especially middle classes, who live in free societies, romanticize nativity and primitivism. This is not something of our time only. It was there from the time of the Greeks, from the time people have known civil society. And the most famous primitive, he says, is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who saw something noble in savages. In literature, I find this state of mind explained best by Charles Dickens. If you read his novel, Dombey and Son, you will see that there is a character there, Cleopatra, who speaks to Mr. Carker, and she says, those darling bygone times, Mr. Carker, with their delicious fortresses and their dear old dungeons and their delightful places of torture and their romantic vengeances and their picturesque assaults and sieges and everything that makes life truly charming, how dreadfully we have degenerated. <laughs> Dissatisfaction with civilization. In our day, I see this condition with middle-class, liberal women who convert to Islam, cover themselves from head to toe in black, ugly gear, take to the streets and say that they are liberated. Liberated from what? And liberated to what? So as <laughs> As far as those women are concerned, I will buy the explanation of romantic primitivism. But there's a second reason, a special sort of embarrassment suffered only by liberals. Um, the American, African-American thinker, writer, and social scientist calls it white guilt. And he says it originated with a sense of shame that white Americans felt towards black Americans in the history of slavery and racial segregation. And that special sort of embarrassment has gone, is not limited only to black Americans, but it has gone over to all peoples of color. And it justifies often development aid. But what is remarkable about this type of insecurity or embarrassment is the inability of modern-day liberals to defend, let alone propagate to non-whites, the ideas, principles, and institutions that helped abolish slave trade, that liberated women, and ended white colonialism. So it's not satisfactory, but it is one of the explanations, and I have met people who suffer it. Then the third, explanation is one given by Paul Berman, another American thinker, um, who, tried, <laughs> who tried to explain 
why celebrated intellectuals, perfectly capable of outing the horrors and moral shortcomings of communism, got all jittery when analyzing Islam. Obviously, he was referring to Ian Buruma and Timothy Garton Ash, who called me an Enlightenment fundamentalist while spending a lot of time defending a creep like Tariq Ramadan. So right now, in our time, dear atheists, dear unbelievers, in Western societies, it is remarkable that it is conservatives and Christians who lead the way in defending such issues as free speech and the rights of Muslim women and the right of Israel to take appropriate measures in dealing with nuclear war. I started with the case of Fatima Abdallah, the woman who was beaten to death and whose case is closed under suicide. It is a Christian group who has taken on her case. They have raised money to try and reopen the case and have failed, but at least on the record, it is a Christian group who have taken it up for her. So what can an atheist alliance do for secular men and women in the Arab and Muslim world at large in general, and for ex-Muslims in Europe and in North America, and Australia and New Zealand, of course. Um, three things. The first is to develop a secular liberal narrative that can compete and counter the Islamist doctrine and mythology. The second is a guide to organization. Secular Muslims are very weak at building institutions and they need help there. Institutions based on this liberal narrative that function. And finally, political and policy training. Organization and mobilization are of course key but the craft of governing is indispensable once you win elections. We have to take this burgeoning movement. I was told there are 4,000 atheists today who have come to this conference. In 2010, the Atheist Alliance brought together 2,500. In the United States, that was 10,000. So you can see that this is a large and growing demography. But we have to take this from being simply a place where we gather and listen to academics and comedy. We must defeat radical Islam and other religious and totalitarian ideologies that threaten our thinking. And we must do that And we must do that while thinking and laughing. Infidel was the epithet, an insult that was thrown at me over and over again by family and former Muslims, Muslim friends. It is a label that I now wear with pride and joy. Let's bring out a toast to reason. And if there's any time, I'll take your questions. I think we have a little time for a few questions if there are people in the audience who wish to have a question. Yes. Uh, we have one over here. Um, I'd like uh, to congratulate Anne on her courage and uh, um, she has an amazing uh, history of being so brave uh, in face of all cruelty in the Muslim world. Um, I have been uh, supported by the same organization when you were studying in the Netherlands, the UIF, um, and uh, I just uh, want to um, ask you one thing. 
Um, when I'm from the Middle East, when I go back, it's like time travel. Um, the mentality and the belief in conspiracy theories is so strong. Uh, even with the point you mentioned, I'm not that optimistic that they will make a progress in the next decade or two. It might take another 500 years. What do you think? Um, I don't think it will take another 500 years. Um, I don't think we should let it take another 500 years. I do understand the conspiracy theories. You have, you have to consider that if you live under an autocracy where there's no freedom of speech, where there's no freedom of conscience, where children from the time they're able to go to school are fed only into state propaganda and Islamist propaganda, and both propagandas reinforce one another in conspiracy theories. Things are never resolved through critical thinking and reason. Things are blamed on outsiders, on Satan, on the Jews, on America, etc. So if you have generations who grow up in that kind of environment, then it's not surprising that they believe in conspiracy theories and that they're susceptible to victimhood and to you know, blaming outsiders. But despite that, uh, I see individuals and groups, a growing number of them, uh, who are questioning not only states, the autocratic states um, that they live under, but they have started also questioning the demand to submit to a god, and that that submission means that some people are in power and others are not. And you see a young demographic that now that is probably not as informed and as educated as individuals who grew up in a liberal society, but who are really hungry for freedom. Hamza Kashgari, whom I mentioned, can you imagine the odds of growing up in Saudi Arabia and coming to the conclusions that he has? That should give you confidence, and not only confidence that these people exist, but if you have any charitable um, traits in you, that is where our charity should be going, in expanding that group of people and helping them along. We have time for one more question up the top there. Fundamental Christians and Zionists believe that Israel is chosen by God to steal Palestinian land. The West turns a blind eye to Israel's continuing violations of international law, while the US pumps $5 billion a year into its economy. Do you think this is the best way for the West to make friends and influence people in the Islamic world? Israelis, please read the Haaretz or the Jerusalem Post, are the first ones to condemn religious fanaticism within Israel. I was reading an article this afternoon. I was reading an article this afternoon in the Haaretz that said that it wasn't only Islamic fundamentalism, but Jewish, you know, Jewish fundamentalism that was a threat to Israel. If you, I live in the United States of America, and if you read the newspapers and you go around, you will see that there is a great deal of criticism on American policy towards Israel, not least of all by Jews. My point is, things in Israel and between the Israelis and the Palestinians can be improved and should be improved. But it's no excuse for Tunisians, for Egyptians, for Pakistanis and Indonesians who are not even neighbors of Israel. It's no excuse for the entire Muslim Ummah of 1.57 billion people to blame Israel for the shortcomings of Islam. That is irrational. And you must agree with me in a conference where we've come to celebrate reason.